So today we're looking at a uh, message that uh, we've had by way of uh, St. Paul's writing from, um, from Rome. He's in a stinking dungeon and uh, writing uh, to us uh, uh, through the uh, church at uh, Colossae. Colossae was in the western part of Turkey and uh, not a major city, uh, but uh, we've memorialized it. Uh, the church has memorialized it through this tremendous four-chapter uh, letter that Paul writes to them with tons of valuable information uh, for us. What, what really caught my attention to the text we're going to look at today is uh, uh, the emphasis on paying attention, you know, watchful, being watchful. And I, I love it every time I hear someone say that they're woke. Uh, and uh, I just think all of us need to be woke to be really paying attention to the issues, opportunities, the needs, uh, not just kind of nationally so we can vote well, but to uh, uh, hey, pay attention to the needs around us, real needs uh, that are uh, evident, uh, especially in New York, we get a deluge of awareness uh, to needs if we are remaining woke. But more deeply, there have been in, in American history, relatively short history compared to the history of all civilization, but within American history, there have been four great awakenings, periods of time when uh, people by huge numbers uh, were drawn to the Lord uh, and with enthusiastic support even of non-believers because it affected uh, policies. There were uh, huge improvements in uh, services to uh, people, safety nets of various sorts, and um, the first one uh, being uh, before the Revolutionary War and the Constitution, but shaping the purposes of the War for Independence, shaping the core values of the Declaration of Independence, shaping the, the Bill of Rights. Second one, just before uh, Civil War, 20 years before the Civil War, with a lot of uh, disruption, advocacy for public schools, which we didn't have before, advocacy for abolition of slavery, especially, and advocacy uh, for women's vote. That one took a little longer, but it was very strong in people's consciousness through an awakening of the churches, awakening of individual people to pray more, to have a passion. Not because they decide, oh, I'm going to spend a couple more minutes in prayer. No, they were driven to pray, had a thirst for righteousness, had a hunger for God's word, and, um, and would come out and, you know, where churches couldn't, couldn't uh, seat them all, they would uh, meet out in the field uh, next to the church or on, a, on the uh, park or whatever, uh, near a church, where, where just thousands of people would gather. Then in uh, early 1900s, uh, Pentecostal revival, led especially by African-American leaders and women. Uh, Amy Semple McPherson uh, became a national figure, a kind of uh, Billy Graham before Billy Graham, uh, uh, amazing, powerful Bible teacher, and very dramatic in the way she uh, preached. We'll talk about that another day. But, uh, and then in the late 50s and through the 60s, um, the... Uh, amazing, awesome leadership of uh, Martin Luther King and, and frequently partnering with Billy Graham, more so than, than people are aware of in our time, uh, and the Jesus Movement that helped create a whole ton of great uh, worship songs and helped uh, enliven worship. Uh, and uh, so a, a wonderful time that has continued to have its effect, but we need a new one. And perhaps uh, preaching about awakening will uh, help us all be prayer warriors uh, for awakening. And this text uh, is a very brief uh, key text, Colossians 4, verse 2, in the next slide. Uh, the text says, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. All right, next slide. Can we go to the next slide? Is it stuck somewhere?
Well, I'll, I'll uh, continue and we'll uh, fix this. We'll be on slide three in a moment. Uh, so be prayerful, watchful, and thankful. Prayerful, watchful, thankful. thankful. Three verbals in this uh, short verse. Prayerful, watchful, thankful. Say them with me if you would. Prayerful, watchful, thankful. Now these three interact in a variety of ways. Next slide, please. These three um, interact, um, and they aren't, they aren't just in one rigid order. If you're prayerful, if you really are in deep prayer, uh, spending time not only sharing from your, your heart and your soul to the Lord, and half of your prayer time listening to the Lord, if you really are focused in uh, prayer time, you're going to be more watchful because you're going to be more alert to what matters to God and really watching for answers to prayer. So prayerfulness leads to being more watchful. But for heaven's sakes, when you're more watchful, you see what's going on around you. You're more attentive to the needs of your, your children, your spouse, needs of neighbors, uh, opportunities that you have before you for professional advancement or, you know, God knows what, Right? And so the more we are alert, the more we are watchful, the more we surely will be prayerful, right? So the, the uh, interaction goes both ways. Next uh, slide, if you would. I've got to be able to change slides quickly here. So watchfulness leads to thankfulness, right? If we really pay attention, like in that hymn we just sang, about the, the simple joys of seeing God's presence cause the, the, uh, the grass to, to sway in the wind. It's still God's presence, right? And, and the beauty of animals and the uh, joy of uh, God's power around us. Uh, so as we're watchful, we're going to be more thankful and more aware who to thank. Thanking one another, of course, for uh, uh, gracious deeds and, and especially... Uh, keeping in mind to thank God. But as we are more thankful, we will be more watchful. If we have a gra grateful attitude, we're going to be looking for opportunities to express that grateful attitude and uh, thus be more watchful. All right, next slide. And if we're more thankful, we will be more prayerful, right? Because a huge role of prayer is to thank God and if we're really thankful, have a thankful attitude, thankful spirit, a grateful spirit, we will definitely be eager to express those uh, feelings, those, that knowledge uh, to the Lord in prayer. And as we're more prayerful, as we're more reminded of where the source is for all our help in prayer, the more thankful we will be. So I do think the order here is not uh, essential and that all three of them empower the other two. Each one of the three uh, can raise the other two to another level. And you can imagine a nice helix as we're, if we really are into what God is teaching through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul's writing here, of these powerful actions of prayer, watchfulness, thankfulness, um, then, then our lives will grow more and more toward the fullness of God in our lives. Now, when he describes uh, prayerfulness, he uh, uh, then uh, picks up this theme in, in the next two verses. You may want to uh, follow along in uh, Colossians uh, chapter 4, here, verse 3. Uh, 3 and 4, he kind of spells out more the, what this uh, prayerfulness uh, means. Verse 3, I, uh, please pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So what does he want? He wants an open door in the next slide, and he wants to be able to proclaim, and that specific uh, uh, proclamation, the mystery of Christ. Uh, so he's got a prayer list he's giving us as well. I, I love having prayer lists, and I hope you uh, do the same. Uh, the, the mystery, perhaps, is what is the mystery of Christ? 
that he wants us to pray for the opportunities for him to proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which he's in chains, but he's not complaining. He's uh, committed to the mystery of Christ. And if we look for how that phrase is used in other places in the New Testament, uh, there are uh, three or four uh, interpretations for that. If you would, the next slide. Uh, one is, is something that is so dear to all of us, uh, the uh, profound grace of God, the forgiveness of God. I'm reminded constantly as I work with, with uh, Jewish people, with uh, Muslim people, Buddhists, and so forth, this radical forgiveness that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ is profound. And they are, this is the one part of the gospel that especially gives them, um, gives them uh, uh, an attitude they're offended by this. We've got to work. we got to pay back. It's up to us to clean up our own act. Well, uh, we have the amazing grace of God to forgive us of our sins and to release us from that guilt in order to empower us on a, to the next level of uh, magnifying his glory, of, of fulfilling his purposes in our lives, not to be dragged down by some a uh, terrible project of having to add up a lot of karma to uh, pay back the bad karma that we've added up. So uh, the mystery of Christ is this uh, idea that uh, religions deny. Religions are all very focused on a works righteousness. Uh, but the gospel is not a religion. It's a relationship. And Jesus has opened the door on that relationship for us to have a, a joyful, trusting relationship with the one we offended the most. But he's forgiven us. And in that joy, to grow as people, to be more and more God's image, to be more and more the women of God or men of God, the daughters of God, the sons of God that he created us to be. The incarnation, too. Uh, you know, e even in Hinduism where they have these avatars, the avatar every time says, I'm not really in the flesh. I just look like I'm in the flesh. Because God can't be in the flesh, according to Hinduism. Uh, it's just a violation of the divine nature. Uh, so uh, in, in every, every religion denies that this is possible. And yet it is the way that salvation is made possible for us. Um, and the very fact that the infinite becoming the infant, the simple Christmas story, the fact that it happened, that fact boggles our minds, as it should. The greatness of God should boggle our minds. When I'm assured by people of religions that, I've, that they've got religions that I can fully understand, I don't trust them. All right? And... Um, I spent a lot of time in, in school with the sciences, especially physics, and, and the wonderful paradoxes of physics remind us that, that physics, and, and as I've demonstrated uh, uh, elsewhere, every discipline has, has huge paradoxes at its core. So there's still a mystery even in uh, every university discipline, but especially the, the mystery of Christ, the mystery that, that in the womb of Mary grew uh, God's presence, God's uh, Son, the Son of God, the fullness of God uh, dwelling with us bodily. Uh, the most amazing miracle uh, as a, a kind of twin equal to the resurrection of Christ, but these two giant miracles uh, making the grace of God possible. And, and the breaking down of the wall between Jew and Gentile. Uh, you know, the you know, religions have always had their, their um, uh, you know, people from outside that, that get persuaded and, and are, uh, uh, you know, joining. But typically religions have been uh, specifically an ethnic group. Uh, even Buddhism, it's either Indian Buddhism or Chinese Buddhism or Japanese Buddhism. They're different. And uh, 
uh, so it's very ethnic specific. But the gospel, according to the Great Commission, and according to how the church has grown uh, throughout the world and continues to grow, uh, and, and sometimes growing especially in the most hostile areas, growing, continuing to grow in China, even as the oppression increases, uh, the, the amazing uh, dynamic is that if you might die for your faith, or if you might lose your job uh, for your faith or not be accepted at the school of your choice because you're a Christian, you're going to really want to know what this is all about. You're going to have a drive to understand why people discriminate against you. And when you're so full of that knowledge of Christ, you will be much more a magnet for others to come to the Lord as well. There, it's, I think the, the fact of risk, even, even if you, know, you don't especially suffer, the fact that risk is there and that you can identify with people suffering in, in China and Nigeria and uh, Cuba and other places, then if we can really identify, we will be all the more devoted uh, because it matters. People are suffering for this awesome faith, this grace of God. People are suffering, and uh, that should drive our commitment to be deeper and more sincere and more vital, and therefore... Uh, draw more and more others uh, to the Lord. And by the way, it's not a secret. I, I, I haven't been approached recently, but, but over the years, a lot of people have tried to convince me to, to join a Masonic group. And they would say, you know, we got our secrets. And they're these, these uh, old, this ancient uh, wisdom, this ancient insights. And at each level, each of the 30 or so levels of, uh, of your a membership into the Masonic Order, you get new secrets, and I'd say, tell me some. I want to know your secrets. No, no, I can't, I can't tell. And I'd say, well, you know, if, if you told me the secret, if I was a member and it was a good secret, really valuable, I'd be broadcasting it to everybody. <laughs> I could not be a good Masonic member. Because the mystery of Christ, unlike the mysteries of the Masonic orders for women or for men, the mysteries of Masonic orders, uh, you have to keep a secret. But the mystery of Christ, we're supposed to, and we enjoy, sharing, right? Share the mystery. That could be a good conversation opener, by the way. Hey, I've got a mystery. And you can start any of these places. I'll certainly talk about the grace of God. The incarnation, the way that, that only in Christ are all people uh, drawn together. So uh, he continues this uh, point of being uh, prayerful in uh, uh, telling us uh, that he wants us, in verse 4, to, to pray that, that his proclamation of the gospel would be absolutely clear. Isn't that beautiful? Paul, who was so articulate about the gospel, here toward the end of his life, is asking for the brothers and sisters to pray that his communication could be totally clear to his audience. What a, what a thought. We should pray for one another in that way. And then a few verses later in verse 12, he references Epiphras, uh, who's also sometimes called in the New Testament Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, five syllables. Anyone here have a five-syllable first name? All right. Uh, but at any rate, uh, sometimes these uh, Greek names uh, go on and on. And uh, Epaphroditus was a devout uh, Christian. And uh, the Bible text in the NIV in verse 12 um, says, uh, uh, Epaphras who is one of you, so he came from Colossae, he's a servant of Christ Jesus, the word servant is doulos, meaning a bond servant, the lowest possible rank in the social order. He sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. 
Isn't that amazing? The simple Lord's Prayer that we might see the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven, Epiphras, miles now away, several hundred miles away from Colossae, uh, uh, hanging out, uh, visiting Paul at the uh, prison in Rome. He is uh, praying earnestly, praying, wrestling in prayer. Just uh, that, that word wrestling in prayer implies a passionate engagement with prayer. This was not just a, a, a passing thought. Uh, he devoted energy, serious energy, uh, to praying. Some translations have, uh, he prays earnestly. That's a great word, right? I'm in earnest prayer for you. Uh, the word itself uh, comes from the Greek word uh, agonizo, uh, or he's agonizing in prayer. He's just, it, it's, it's not like he's full of pain over it, but he's just, he's, he's struggling in prayer that in the most deepest part of his soul, he's saying maybe words that cannot be uttered, uh, or saying through the Spirit, saying his desire for there to be, you know, full of uh, maturity and assurance and following the will of God, that, that he's agonizing in prayer. I pray, I agonize in prayer that each of you would agonize in prayer on some frequent basis. Um, you know, a passing prayer, help me Jesus in a situation, whatever, understood. But there needs to be some deep prayer. We're going to grow in prayer at all. If we're going to grow as, as women of God, men of God, uh, we need those agonizing times of prayer, that wrestling with prayer, wrestling in prayer with God. Uh, earnest, earnest prayer. So prayerful, that's uh, the first point that uh, Paul adds in these three points. And then uh, secondly, he, he talks about being watchful. Um, actually, one other thought. Excuse me. One other thought on prayer. A, a very important one. It's interesting that these three, they are not a summary of the, the letter, but curiously, the first point, prayer, is strengthened by something Paul says in chapter 1. The second point, being watchful, maybe intentionally, but it's, again, it's not a summary but there is an important paragraph in chapter 2 that goes deep on watchfulness. And the third point, being thankful, curiously, there's a paragraph in chapter 3 on how to be more thankful. All right? So, again, this is not a summary of the whole letter. You need the whole letter. It doesn't take long to read anyway, just three or four pages in your Bible. But, uh, but here, I think, is one of the most profound hymns to Christ. Uh, just an amazing uh, passage from uh, the first uh, chapter of uh, Colossians. Um, and this uh, I took from NIV. You could read along with me from your own uh, Bible. Uh, give joyful thanks. Give joyful thanks to the Lord who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, invisible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God has pleased, was pleased, to have all the fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace 
through his blood shed on the cross. Now, when you pray, if you remind yourself who you're praying to and whose name you're using when you pray, this awesome source of all of creation, this one in whom all of creation uh, holds together. You know, physics uh, was one of my, was my favorite science, and I love the idea of a unified field theory, which back in, when I was in high school, people were talking about, we need a unified field theory. Well, we've not gotten one yet, but I don't mind they're working on it. If they get it, wonderful. Um, and the idea is to have, a, uh, since the, the uh, electromagnetic fields are very different from gravitational fields, which are very different from the strong nuclear fields, which are very different from the weak nuclear fields, all right? Be nice if there was be one formula that, that systemized all of them. We don't have it. Maybe we'll never get it. I don't know. I don't have an opinion. But what I do know is we have a unified person theory that the whole thing is held together in Jesus. Verse 17 again, uh, this amazing statement. Uh, he was before all things, and in him, in Christ, in our Lord Jesus Christ, all things hold together. In plain language, Jesus is the cosmic glue. And he's also your glue. He's what holds you together. Um, and I've, I've played with uh, fellow Christian scholars sometimes because I, I, I have uh, kind of multifaceted theories and, and the, I'd be challenged, well, what well, holds it together? What holds your theory together? And I'd like to smile and say, Jesus holds it all together. And um, either they like the answer or they're a little irritated. But the fact is, he does. And uh, you could throw up you know, a whole doctrine on that, that's fine, but it's the living Lord Jesus Christ that continues to hold it all together. Now, what I think is often easily missed, and I have no judgment, no uh, complaint, but, but Paul is, is using this hymn. You can imagine music uh, set to this, um, but he's also using a powerful linguistic tool called a chiasm uh, as a way of framing the verse 17, which is really the high point. So we can go to the next slide. At least you'll see uh, visually what this means. Um, I know the print is uh, very tiny. And maybe for the, for the camera, you could zoom in on that. Uh, but there's an E value at beginning and end. You can imagine this turn this way, and it's like a mountain. Um, and the E value is about Jesus rescue us, of us and making peace. And that's like the basic level of, of his ministry. And, and that's, uh, you know, verse 13 and verse 20b. And then verse 14 and 20a emphasize uh, the work of reconciliation and deliverance. He provided deliverance according to verse 14. And in 20a, reconciliation. A reconciliation with God, which is deliverance. Deliverance is reconciliation with God. So different words, but the same point. You know, what I, I have observed is a lot of people, and I don't know uh, you all uh, uh, very deeply, so uh, apply it as you wish, but I think many of our fellow Christians only get to the D level in terms of their knowledge of Christ. That he is the fullness of God to really experience in him the fullness of God's presence. And in and verse 15, so fullness in 19 and 15, he's the image of the invisible God. That fullness, that image of the invisible God, he is, we can see God in, in uh, looking toward Jesus. That experience, I pray that you've had. So we're getting closer to really experiential awareness of the, the peak of the, primary emphasis of this uh, paragraph. Then the next level, which is 16 and 18, he created this uh, for, he has created for him all these things, including thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. Uh, so it's more of the secular world. 
but then the parallel in 18 is he's the head of the body, the church. So he's the head of what's going on in the second world. He's the head of the body, the church. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord in the church and out of the church. Now, it's pretty messy sometimes in the church, pretty messy outside, and uh, the Lord has patience, but he's still the ultimate uh, boss. Jesus Christ is Lord, the sovereignty of God. But all that ultimately supporting the grand statement, he exists above and before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So when you think of the greatness of Christ, doesn't that motivate you to pray more? And with greater faith? More awesome requests? Uh, since he's not limited, his uh, warehouse is not about to close. All right? So uh, that's the prayer point. Now moving on, the watchful point. Uh, let's go to uh, the next slide. Uh, and he develops the watchful uh, theme, especially in verses 5 and 6. So immediately, just this immediate context, uh, he encourages us in verse 5. He says, uh, be wise in the way you are toward outsiders. So uh, develop wise relationships. Um, and uh, make the most of every opportunity. Really look for opportunities and, and jump into those opportunities. Do, do the good that God opened those opportunities for. Whether it's, it's helping someone in need you know, w without a clear statement of gospel or looking for opportunities to, uh, to share the gospel, share a portion of scripture. And then uh, fill your conversations with grace. Boy, you've got to love that sentence, right? We, we talk about receiving God's grace, having a graceful moment, but to fill our conversation with grace? That's a great reminder. First part of uh, verse 6, and then, thus, you know how to answer anyone. You're in a good relationship already. You've filled the conversation with uh, grace. And then, uh, so that's a, a strong emphasis on being watchful. Uh, part of being watchful, I think, is, is the way we organize the, the knowledge that we have. And so we go to the next slide. And the next slide is uh, a partial quote, accurate partial quote from Colossians 2. Remember we said the first point, prayer, is strengthened especially by a, a portion of Colossians 1. Second point, being watchful, is strengthened especially by a portion, a paragraph in Colossians 2. Now, just to step back a moment, this part of a verse was quoted at me any time I ever said to uh, the elders in my church or, or friends who were you know, you know, very spiritually committed uh, that I wanted to study philosophy. So they partially quote this verse. Uh, See to it that no one takes you captive uh, uh, through hollow and deceptive philosophy. And they were interpreting like every philosophy is hollow and deceptive, all right? So let no one take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Sounds pretty dreadful. And I would even have that, you know, not, not the next phrase, but that typed out and, and taped to my door uh, even as a, as a kind of a threat or warning. And of course, I would uh, pay attention to it. And um, I had already studied this passage, but if I had forgotten how the next few words went, I would uh, simply open the word. And here's where the, uh, the, that sentence, that verse even is uh, finished by... Uh, four more words, rather than on Christ, all right? So beware of deceptive philosophy that's based on all kinds of bad stuff, um, rather than on Christ, meaning there is philosophy that's based on Christ. 
You can have a whole worldview based on Christ, a whole perspective of, of you know, uh, politics and business and economics and the arts, uh, you know, the sciences, uh, family, uh, raising children, all kinds of areas where we can have a philosophy based on Christ. And that's the whole point, uh, to be able to discern between what's just uh, uh, talk talk or even evil and deceptive and, um, and uh, twisted thinking of which the world has plenty of or what is in fact uh, based on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in body form, similar to what uh, Paul said in chapter 1, just in case you missed it in chapter 1. The, the fullness of, of God in Christ. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So those of you who are worried about President Trump, guess what? Jesus is above him. Those who are worried about uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, got good news for you. Jesus is above both of them and a whole, everyone else, too. Jesus is above the UN. Now, he lets a lot of goofiness go on, on all sides, uh, but the, the joy is uh, he knows what he's doing. He's got a plan, and we can trust him. We must trust him and develop our thinking, even for in a secular environment to, uh, of school, to develop our thinking by asking, really, from Jesus' point of view, how does this make sense? How do the issues get redefined from Jesus' point of view? And uh, God can help you, and there are great books uh, that people have written uh, to, to help. Um, but I'm uh, constantly disappointed, just to be honest with you. I was on the advisory board for university Christian Fellowship, for example, for years, and every meeting I would ask, you know, how, how many of the students in university are actually studying a Christian worldview? And the numbers were not good. Um, and tragically, a lot of Christians are at the university and don't even go to university or, or to uh, the uh, Olivet-oriented uh, campus ministry or your know, crew or any of the others. So there's there's a real dearth when, the, when students need that help. We really need to do it. Even I, I went to the Baptist Student Union at University of Virginia when I was a student there, and I said, I'd like to do a seminar on Christian worldview. I'll do it for free. Let's, let's see if we can invite all kinds of uh, uh, people in your network to come. And, and the director said, don't bother. They wouldn't be interested. They wouldn't come. I can still hear his voice in my ear. So it's nice to say Jesus is Lord, but don't mess up uh, academic careers. No, we give meaning as we see Christ as Lord of every sphere. So more on that maybe another day too. But watchful. Why are we watchful? Because it's all in his hands and our location is in Christ. That phrase, in Christ, Paul uses repeatedly in this short book, or in him. I think it's 15 times it's either in Christ or in him. And where is Paul when he's writing this? In jail. <laughs> no, he's in Christ. His, his street address is a Roman prison, but he's in Christ. Isn't that awesome? What an attitude. Uh, it's inspiring. We could do it too. You don't have to tell everybody, but wherever we are, especially if it's a stinky place, to remind ourselves we're in Christ and be empowered, be grateful, be more watchful, and full of prayer. So then we have uh, uh, one more uh, lesson here to be thankful. And for that, we just have one uh, biblical passage, this time from chapter 3 of uh, Colossians, uh, where uh, Paul says, let the peace of Christ, here chapter 3, starting with verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since the members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Now, a lot of people have interpreted this very well 
Let the peace of God rule in your heart. You're about to make a decision. You've convinced yourself it's the right decision, but you're actually not at peace about it. And the advice is that I endorse, don't make that decision. Wait to, through prayer, consulting mature believers, um, meditating on the Lord, reading scripture. Wait till you're at peace. Have God's peace in you. Let the peace of God rule. The peace of Christ rule. Very deep guidance. Verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. What were we doing when we began under the leadership of Marie and James and Sylvia? Exactly what Paul tells us we should do to be more thankful, right? So we already uh, checked that one off for this morning anyway. You can still sing on the way home or wherever. Um, but these songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Awesome. And it doesn't say you've got to uh, 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 pass a test to have a, a good tone quality. Uh, no, just sing. Just sing. Because it's from your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. So thankfulness is big. Having a thankful attitude. And you know, people around you that are grateful kinds of people, they're a lot nicer to be around. So let's all get with that program and be grateful to one another and grateful to God. So three simple words. Prayerful, watchful, thankful. Together, prayerful, Watchful, thankful, a little louder. Prayerful, watchful, thankful. And one more slide. Together. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Great God, we just thank you for these awesome key words that help shape, help renew, help revitalize, help encourage us in a relationship, a personal, vibrant, real grace-filled relationship with you to be more prayerful, more watchful, and more thankful. Thank you, God, for your awesome teaching. Uh, help us each to learn these a little more than we have, or a lot more than we have learned in the past. In Jesus' name, amen.